This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, declare the meeting officially open to the public. Um, can I just remind members, firstly, about the use of electronic equipment, um, if they can put their phones on silent and remove them from the countertops. And we'll just wait on public coming in. <coughs> I think I'll just press on. I'll just press on and then I'll come back to um It's here. Trying to find my badge. You want to take a wee seat at the back just before and then we'll pull you up. Thank you. Okay, can I just remind uh, members of the public um, to turn off any electronic equipment? You are able to use the Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi code is available. Um, I'll then move on to agenda, agenda item number one. I have one apology and that's from Jonathan Buckley. Are members aware of any other apologies? No. No. no? Okay, thank you. I'll move on then to Chairperson's Business, item number two. Can I firstly um, welcome Fra McCann onto the committee? Um, I worked with Fra previously on, on another committee and I know he has a wealth of experience and knowledge on a lot of the issues that we'll be here to discuss, so you're very welcome, Fra. Thank you very much. And we will miss Emma, but you're very welcome. Um, can I then uh, inform members that they have been provided with a memo at page 5 outlining the plans for the Committee Strategic Planning Day, um, which is next Thursday in the Skinos Centre. Um, uh, can I ask members, are they content uh, to note or have any comments on that? Content. Thank you very much. Um, members should also like to be aware of the um, NIAO report on governance issues uh, during a period in which there was considerable instability in the organisation. It's table paper. Um, I think we need assurance that those issues have been addressed and implementation for better governance arrangements are underway in Sport NI. I also know the Public Accounts Committee have primacy on these matters, but subject to that, are members content that we schedule a briefing on that issue? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Chair, just a note of a conflict of okay. interest as a former Minister for DECAL when That's the fine. first investigation started. That's fine. Thank you, Carol. Um, item number three is the draft minutes. Can I refer members to page eight of your meeting pack? Can I ask members if they're content with the minutes of the 5th of March as drafted? Yes, great. Thank you. Um, agenda item four is matters arising. Um, members have been provided at page 14 with correspondence from the Cliff Edge Coalition. Members asked for further information, including the group's speaking notes following the briefing session on the 20th of February. Um, members, any comments? Or are they content to note? And to note. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, also been provided at page 379 with the B departmental reply to committee queries on the social security fines deductions from benefits regulations and social fund funeral expenses amendment regulations. Again, are members content to note or do they have any comments? No, content. Okay, thank you. Members also been provided at page 384 with the departmental reply to committee queries on PIP universal credit and the bereavement support payment regulations. Again, members content to note or any comments? Content. Okay, thank you. And then um, at the meeting on the 5th of March, a member raised the issue of a consultation on PIP being issued. Mm -hmm. um, the department has responded at page 426 to say that this is not a consultation but a call for evidence which has been issued by the department on behalf of an independent reviewer. Um, are members content to note are any comments on that? No content. Thank content. you. Mm -hmm. uh, then move on. Uh, members have also been provided at page 396 uh, with a departmental reply to committees on queries on the following ongoing development projects, public realm schemes, city deals, community planning, Causeway Close to Glens Council, Code of Conduct for Councillors and Woodvale and Shankill Community Association. Again, are members content to answer any comments? To yes, content, but we may need to come back to some of those at a later stage, particularly around the regeneration and then the department, I'm assuming, once the investigation into <coughs> the Woodfield yeah. House and Association is completed, then we'll probably get an update, but it's not really appropriate before that in relation to the Housing Association. But just to keep a watch and brief on uh, the regeneration and the public realm stuff, particularly okay. with local government. Okay, that's noted. Thank you, Carol. Um, then move on then to members then have been provided at page 426 with the departmental response to committee queries on the sub-regional stadia programme for soccer. Are members content to note this or any comments? Content, yes. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay. Um, also being provided at page 49 with a press release from Revise NI on failures affecting vulnerable, sick and disabled people claiming universal credit. Again, are you content to note or do you have any comments? Content. Thank you. We'll move on then to agenda item five, which is correspondence. Um, you'll find the correspondence memo at page 436 of your meeting packs. Um, can I draw your attention to a letter on page 56 from the Alzheimer's Society? Um, uh, they uh, they won the um, dementia friendly or the housing executive won the dementia friendly Lar large organisation of the year award in 2019, which is just excellent news. Um, and uh, 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 I'm, I'm interested that we should set up a visit either to the housing executive or to a social housing scheme um, with people who are living with dementia. Um, it probably will be after the Easter recess, and I know that the, the Dementia Week is in May, um, but it may be something that we'd yeah. want to consider. There's a, a great project on the Grosvenor Road. It's run by, I think, it's, is it North and West, isn't it, Fra? North and West and Clam Mill. North and West and Clam Mill. It's um, all, all dementia. It's actually marvellous. It's, it's, it's marvellous. really, it's really, really exemplary okay. project. Um, okay. And even the the connections they have with, you know, like the jam card. Mm -hmm. mm. That you know they're responsible or they're working in conjunction with partnership in that. But even in terms of the the progression of the disease and the work they do with families is exemplary. Schools. And the schools, the local schools are all involved about dementia awareness as well. And I, I know Very also good. of Hemsworth Court as well. Yeah. Um, it, it, the excellent work they do too. Um, I, I just think that given we're, we're, we're always very good at, at talking down the housing executive and what they don't do, and I think this is something that we should congratulate them and celebrate of mm -hmm. the good work that they have done here. Absolutely. Um, so if members are content, um, we'll maybe even t talk about that a bit further at our yeah. OI day next week. I think that would be a useful visit for either as a committee meeting or a, uh, or a committee visit after a meeting, mm -hmm. um, but we can discuss that further if they have... You know, if, if there's availability to do that. Meeting, then one of the, 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 the Grabner Road ones, uh, once a year old, you can maybe do a committee meeting there. Yeah, well, Chair, we'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a look yeah. at that, Fra. Absolutely. Rob, did you? Yeah, can I agree with you, Chair, that we do tend to talk down the housing executive and complain about the housing executive, but in this case where there's a degree of credit uh, to be awarded, perhaps it would be appropriate that you write to the housing executive and congratulate them okay. on, yeah. on that. On behalf of the committee, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Okay. That's grant members. Thank you. Um, uh, are members content to action all correspondence as outlined other otherwise in the memo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Chair, could I just raise? I mean, some of the information we got is really, really useful. Uh, it's very long, um, and it would be good even just in terms of. Well, you're you've got a good research facility here, and I'm not asking one researcher to critique another researcher's work, it's not about that. It's also about making sure in the context of universal credit, in the same way we did with the Cliff Edge Coalition, trying to get the relevance between what we're trying to do in strategy rules and this. Um, I mean, we can all pass it on to our parties and, and they can help us out too, but it's just that there's a lot of work put in it. You just don't want to note it and move on. Is there anything new so that we could do with this? in relation to potential legislation or strategy rules or LCMs that will be bringing forward. Um, because it did, it did take me quite a while reading it and you're just you're just kind of sitting going, you know, if we noted, that's fine, but is there anything else we could do? And I understand that and I suppose up to date with a lot of the correspondence that has come in, yeah. we have just noted it because we haven't, uh, I suppose it's looking at what our priorities yeah, and what exactly. the Minister's priorities are going forward. Um, the, the, uh, I know certainly the committee clerk and I have discussed this about um, looking more in depth to all of that correspondence mm -hmm. at some stage and how then we facilitate um, any further briefings. So it, it's certainly I'm mindful of it. I don't want to, because there's such a lot of information we get through correspondence and other means yeah. that we kind of skip over because we have a structured plan of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's mindful that we keep a running brief of all of those um, pieces of, of correspondence for going forward in the future um, for um, any further sessions or briefings that we do require. And maybe so, even next week after a session we'll be able to yeah. actually bring some of that research and some of the information we've got. We might be able to just do something with it after that. Yeah. 
No, thank you. Good point. Thank you. Okay. Otherwise, members, are you consent are content then with the uh, the memo and correspondence as mm -hmm. outlined? No. Yeah. No. Okay, we're going to move on then to item agenda six, which is a briefing by Deputy Secretary for st Strategic Policy and Professional Services. Members will find the briefing at agenda item uh, or this agenda on page <coughs> five six seven. And can I invite Beverly Wall, Gavin Patrick, Paul McKillen, Alison Cosgrove, and Karen Ward to come forward? Thank you. Thank Without Beverly, Gavin, and Paul. Yes, okay. Beverly, do you yeah. want to go ahead? Thank you, Chair, uh, and good morning. Um, I'm accompanied today by colleagues Gavin Patrick, Director of Finance, and Paul McKillen, Director of Central Policy, Alison Cosgrove, Director of Transformation, Comms and Engagement, and Karen Ward, Director of Governance and Commercial Services, are behind me. So, if you're content, what I'll do is we we'll cover these two areas finance and central policy, and then swap over staff, and they'll come forward. Okay. Um, I'd like to give you, first of all, just an overview of the key responsibilities of Strategic Policy and Professional Services Group, and then outline some of the current issues. And I propose, if you're content, that as we go through each of the slides, that I pause at the end of each directorate's responsibilities for questions, if that's content with you. So um, you'll see from the range of responsibilities um, that the SPPS Group uh, have that we're very much at the heart of the department, uh, supporting the delivery of ministers' objectives and the proper functioning of the department. My group comprises of four directorates, and there are just under 300 members of staff across that group. We're responsible for many of the department's corporate services, which includes financial management, corporate governance and commercial services, press office and comms, the Minister's private office, Assembly Liaison and the Permanent Secretary's office. The group coordinates the department's input to the programme for government and manages business planning across the department. We also lead on a number of key cross-cutting social policies such as poverty and child poverty, gender equality and sexual orientation, active <coughs> ageing and disability. And the group also supports the department's policy makers through the provision of advice and guidance. In addition, we have led in the Department's preparations for EU exit, and we are now taking forward further work around UK-EU future relations, as well as business continuity planning in respect of COVID-19. So, Turning then to Finance Directorate, Financial Management Directorate is responsible for the overall management of the Department's budget as allocated by the Executive and also Treasury resources allocated to Social Security. It provides financial support services including accounting as well as banking and payment management services. The committee will be aware that the Executive will need to agree a budget for 2021, followed by Minister's decisions on final allocation within the Department. In terms of budgets for 2021 and beyond, the budget will be set for one year, but I think it's fair to say that a longer multi-year review period would create more certainty around departmental planning. We have submitted an early estimate of costs arising from the commitments identified in the New Decade New Approach Agreement of 114.7 million capital and 343.3 million resource. Now, these are very early estimates and further work will be required to scope and cost the nature of the commitments, including implementation costs in line with the views of Minister. The Committee has requested a separate briefing session on the Department's 2021 budget on the 2nd of April, which will provide members with more detail, but I am happy to answer any questions you may have around finance, finances at this stage. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Members, any questions around finance that you want to bring up, or will we just continue on? We, we generally find that when yeah. it all comes into one, then at the in. end, and it's yeah. much easier uh, if we do it that way. Did you want to come in there, Mark? Yeah. yeah thank you, Chair, and thank you, Beverly. Just in those financial commitments, I suppose, or, or asks yes. to make the commitments in the new decade, new approach. 
deal their additional and new on top yes. of everything? Yes. Yes. Could you outline sorry, what, what those commitments are in terms of capital and um, The majority would be in relation to uh, mitigations um, and uh, on, the, on the resource side, and on the capital would be in relation to housing. So, so in terms of the, the mitigation side, is it completely new per se, or does it take into account the fact that we're currently paying mitigations as it is? Um, an element of it is the, the mitigations that are in, in place at the moment, um, uh, but the majority would be um, potential new mitigations, um, which, as Beverly said, it's a very early um, session um, and haven't been fully scoped yet. But. OK, thank you. Members, anything further on that? No? It does come back at the end. Aye. Yeah, the end. I'm saying. Yeah. Do you want to continue? Moving on now, Chair, to Central Policy Directorate, our professional services unit comprises statisticians and economists, and they provide analytical and economic research and evidence to underpin both operational and policy decision-making. That team has responsibility for publishing official stats from the Family Resources Survey, which would include official measures on poverty, and also the Continuous Household Survey, from which we derive statistics on engagement in culture, arts and sports, including the use of Irish and Ulster Scots. The team also publishes a number of statistical publications each year, including on benefits and housing. Strategic Policy Planning and Equality Unit um, uh, are responsible for coordination of all departmental inputs to the programme for government, and outcomes 8 and 9 are owned by DFC uh, Permanent Secretary and contain <coughs> actions for this, this department, but also <coughs> across the civil service. And we also contribute to six other outcomes. We're currently working with colleagues in TEO and other departments to refresh the programme for government in line with the commitments set out in New Decade New Approach. The Equality Unit provides advice, information and guidance to minister, officials and business areas on equality and human rights, and specific re responsibilities include the statutory equality duties set out in Section 75 and also the Department's Equality Scheme. That team also has policy responsibility for children and adult safeguarding arrangements across the department, and we have a departmental children and adult safeguarding policy for our staff. An updated Section 75 Equality Plan, which sets out the actions the department proposes to take to address identified inequalities related to our departmental functions, will be presented to Minister for consideration by the end of this month. And we've also produced a dis draft disability plan outlining how we meet our statutory requirements in respect of the Disability Discrimination Act. And those are to promote positive attitudes towards disabled people and encourage the participation of disabled people in public life. Um, that paper is currently with Minister at the moment for approval to issue to public consultation. These areas of work align closely to our overall remit of building policy making capacity across the department. And we do that through a number of distinct areas. Firstly, the department has a policy excellence group, which is a working group of policy makers within the department who seek to embed effective and modern policy making approaches across the department. Secondly, the team delivers an annual social welfare summer school. And that's a cross-border event in collaboration with the Department for Employment Affairs and Social Protection. Summer School has been running now for 20 years and provides an excellent development opportunity for staff from both jurisdictions. And the 21st Summer School is due to take place at Queen's this year from the 9th to 15th of August. And the theme for this year is Welfare Traditions and tra Transitions. And thirdly, this team provides a series of policy seminars for staff to share best practice and innovation and policy making with colleagues across the department. And some examples of sessions that have been delivered for staff include preparing for government in advance of the return of, of government, social prescribing, rural needs and equality impact assessments. And we've also had seminars to raise awareness of broader issues which impact the work of the department, such as LGBT awareness and community planning. 
Last but not least, um, that unit has led on the planning for the UK's departure from the EU and the impacts of that on the Department for Communities and the people we serve. Uh, during the current transition period, the focus has shifted to inputs to the negotiations pro process, which for DSC has centred around our Welfare to Work agenda, the UK Prosperity Fund and any remaining EU funding programmes which may continue to be delivered in Northern Ireland following the UK's exit. We are also focused on identifying on any potential negative impacts of a non-negotiated outcome on vulnerable households and communities. And the Minister is due to present a paper to the Executive's EU Exit Subcommittee on this issue shortly. Turning next um, to um, our social policy responsibilities. And uh, the directorate leads uh, on the delivery of a number of key social policies and strategies, and those include anti poverty and child poverty, active ageing, disability, gender, and sexual orientation. And whilst the department is on the lead in these strategies, it's important to note that many of the key actions within them will be owned by other departments. <coughs> and will work closely with our delivery partners to ensure actions are aligned to programme for government outcomes and that action owners are signed up to deliver and report on their commitments within the strategies. A paper is currently being prepared for Minister's consideration, which sets, will set out proposals to progress the full range of social policy strategies using a co-design approach. And that submission will set out the timetable for production of the strategies and proposals for the stakeholder groups that will be established to work alongside the Department in developing each strategy, including the planned membership and terms of reference. And once the Minister has approved the detail of the co-design approach that will be taken to the strategy development, work on developing those strategies will progress. And as work across all of those strategies progresses, we will, of course, engage with the Committee at key points in the process. Chair, before I swap over staff okay. and move to transformation comms and engagement, are there any questions? Yeah, I suppose I just want to pick up on the on the part about the strategies, and uh, we were told the previous meeting that those strategies um, there, there would, uh, would be uh, by the end of March 2020. We would see. Uh, a paper on that. Is that still on yes. course for that to yes. go ahead? Yes, um, and there is a commitment in New Decade approach that the Minister will provide a timeline for the development of those strategies by the end of this month. And okay, and it's also good to note that you mentioned about the, the, the co-production with yeah. other departments, because yes. we know over <coughs> over the years um, that there have been a lot of silo working where people haven't um, shared responsibility, and um, with I suppose with all of those strategies, they nearly fall into all departments. Um, so that's good to know that also. Um, the part about the the anti poverty, the anti poverty strategy, and the <coughs> child strategy. I note there that um, about the development of a standalone strategy are aligned with the anti poverty yeah. strategy. What's the the thinking behind that? Okay, um, so. Our thinking is that many of the actions that would sit within a, a poverty strategy would encompass children. Okay. And so the proposal is that the subgroup, the co-design subgroup, will consider that issue and make a decision, an informed decision, on whether there should be a standalone strategy uh, for anti-poverty and a standalone poverty strategy for child uh, poverty whether we should have one strategy um, and our counterparts in the south of Ireland have, have incorporated both those issues in one strategy and their roadmap for social inclusion but that's a decision that we would want and be keen that our um, subject matter experts and the co-design subgroup would come to a position on and, and make a decision on and a recommendation to minister on that. Okay, I have a few members down already. So, Kelly, you're first, then Fra, then Sinead, then Carl, then Robin. Thank you very much. Everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to give you your orders. You <laughs> um, I was interested when you talked about the overall financial management um, of the Social Security. I'm just to bring you back to that one, we're very aware um, that there are gaps in our legislation at the moment. The ONS reclassification, we haven't brought that forward yet. The welfare mitigations legislation, we haven't seen that yet. Um, 
have you? I just don't know how we're going to cope with the the cost that we will incur. Um, have you planned that into the future? But obviously, we haven't seen what the, the departmental thinking is on that budget. But there's substantial costs there um, that could eat into a budget. Yes, and how that's going to be delivered. And, and there will be significant costs around around those issues, and we have factored that within. And, and decisions around welfare mitigations will rest with the executive. But I'm just worried about the gap in legislation at the moment between the end of the current financial year <coughs> and when that legislation is yes. going to come in. Because we're, I, think, I think I heard it was going to cost £3 million a month to um, cover the costs for co-ownership. And then we don't know how long it's going to take for the legislation to come in for the welfare mitigation. So people are going to get hit with the bedroom tax. There's a gap there. And there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as to how much that will cost and, and who it's going to affect and how is the department going to cope with that? Well, on, on the uh, co-ownership, um, we're working with DOF on that okay. and, and, and equally with mitigation. So um, we are on, with the 2021 budget, work ongoing. It's the ongoing discussions with mm -hmm. DOF and we're in close contact. So um, uh, uh, we obviously need to work through after the, the budget yesterday and and the executive to make um, decisions on the overall budget and then how that works through into our departmental budget. Thank you. Just a couple of other questions at this stage, um, Chair. Thank you. Um, when you talked about the disability um, work that you're doing internally within the department, can I just ask, um, quite often when departments put forward their disability, internal disability strategies, um, it doesn't include how departmental officials, officers, have dealings with people with disabilities who come from outside of the department. I was just wondering, will your strategy have some sort of a guidance for staff that are frontline, front-facing, customer-facing staff and their dealings with disabilities? Because not just the department, but any of the arm's length bodies or contracted groups that deal with people with disabilities. We all know the issues with PIP, um, but I'm just wondering if there's anything within that strategy that will consider training or informing departmental staff about dealing with external customers. And what we have done as a department, we have rolled out the JAM card. Scheme has been rolled out across our jobs and benefits offices and across our offices. Um, and but that. Um, plan will set out how we will, as a department, promote those positive attitudes towards disabled people and how we will di support disabled people who come <coughs> seeking services that are provided through the department. Okay. Can I just confirm, Jam Card is amazing. I'm very jealous of it. It doesn't exist in rural areas, so not much point in town staff and benefits offices outside of Belfast about it if it's not ruled out there. There's other forms, like MENCAP, for instance, of the hospital passport scheme that some others use. Um, I think it, it would be good to know yeah. And, and, and what I can say about that draft disability strategy is we did do a series of, if you like, pre-consultation engagements with the disability sector in developing that plan. Um, but then when that plan goes out to consultation, we would also be happy to and will be proactive in engaging further with the disability sector around their responses to that consultation and how we respond to those and how we amend the plan accordingly. Today. And will that involve your arm's length bodies and contracted organisations? So and how they treat? No, this is this is a, a responsibility, a statutory responsibility on the department and other bodies will have their own responsibilities. But that's what I'm just saying, if the department are funding arm's length bodies yes. and they're having the contracts with other bodies, surely then there must be something that has to flow so it's it's a holistic treatment of people with disabilities. Um, I'm just, I'm quite yes. keen that, yes. that that would be, the department no, manages that. No, I take your point on that and we will consider that, yeah. And then just finally, I, thank you very much. I, I could talk all day to you, but I'm not going to take up your time. Um, I'm really delighted to hear about the co-design approach. Um, but you've talked about um, the terms and conditions we set up and then the groups will come. Yeah. Is there anybody from within the disability sector or other sectors that are involved with the policy development who are actually from that sector? Um, like nothing about us without us. You know, is there somebody with yes. disabilities, LGBT, gender? I imagine there would be. Um, setting setting those terms and conditions. Okay, so in terms in terms of the terms of reference for those yes, right. those those subgroups will be made up of. So if you take for example on a disability ability plan, those subgroups will contain reps from disability organisations, and we're keen that we will have a broad range of you know disability 
organisations represented on that, and then the terms of reference would be agreed by them. By them. That's brilliant. No, that that's yeah. <coughs> and that will vary depending on each each you know each strategy will have a different subgroup. Yeah. No, absolutely, because I'm just hearing from other departments that terms of references are being written first and then people are coming <coughs> in, so no, that's no, really so what we will have is a, we, we will draft terms of reference with Minister with and then the intention would be that that group would then consider and agree those terms of reference. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Fred. Chair, it's just, uh, you're very welcome. To thank, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's just uh, picking up on one of the questions that Kelly had asked, and I think it's crucial, that, especially in the development of strategies, uh, that the, the, the groups who reflect and represent them, I mean, just thinking about RNIB, gay dogs, uh, <coughs> disability groups, that all that is uh, disability friendly. And, and I think they have to play a crucial role in the development of strategy when I think. And uh, just the moving on, that, that I'm interested in the the, uh, the establishment of a stakeholder groups, how, how it's done, who, uh, who they are, how they approach it. And I have this being the panel going come back a long time, and that is that you, you end up with the usual suspects rather than broadening out to bring new new thinking and new people in to, to, to help with the development of strategies. And yeah, and that, that's a challenge we're very aware of, that you know, if you take, for example, developing an anti-poverty strategy, um, I'm meeting with neighbourhood renewal partnerships mm. next week to talk about how those neighbourhood renewal partnerships, which have, have for many years worked with in areas of deprivation around yeah. targeting poverty, how we can um, harness the skills and expertise within those partnerships, um, within the co-design subgroup for anti-poverty, but then how also we can use, for example, the neighbourhood renewal partnerships to access and hear the voices of people living in poverty when we're developing those strategies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it won't just be a group of people sitting in a room as a subgroup deciding on the basis of evidence what the themes and priorities of a strategy would be. We'd be supporting those groups to go out to hold focus groups in local communities and with those, for example, who have a disability or who are living in poverty to have their views taken within that to ensure that that strategy genuinely meets the needs of yeah. individuals and meets sure. objective uh, need. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I'm let's just aim to just to, to, to uh, take this moment to, to congratulate the people who, over the years, have run the, the neighbourhood renewal partnerships and uh, provide with the, and the, the department should take some pride uh, in terms of the, 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 that strategy because it has provided a lifeline to many of the communities that uh, are find it really, really difficult. Uh, can I just add, add, an add, add on to what Fra was saying there? And I know Robin wants to ask something as well about that. Um, when we're looking at anti poverty, I mean, a part of anti poverty to reduce poverty is to get people into good jobs, well paid jobs, give them skills that are going to be skills for life. And I bang on about this all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so as part of that, we need to be looking at industries. We need to be looking at our our, our higher and further education colleges. Um, so that I mean, does that build into that as well? Yes. Um, where we're looking at, at improving people's lives. You know, I, I, I our thinking as officials is that when we look at an anti-poverty strategy, the three key themes within that would be around reducing economic inactivity, um, reducing income inequality, and improving skills, education, and training. Um, and and that, that could be done around interventions, and that's this is very much a decision for those subgroups. But this could be done around when it comes to an action plan, interventions for children, working age, and the older population. But those are very much decisions for that co-design subgroup, but also stretch stretch way beyond the remit and the responsibility. I mean, another the issue very dependent on the anti-poverty strategy, especially for women and for families, is the child care <coughs> element, child care strategy. It's a key element. So it very much will have to work with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the work that has been done to date on developing consultation proposals around poverty are very much childcare is, is without a doubt one of the key mm -hmm. key areas. Um, childcare, low income, health yeah. and disability. Um, you know, and there, there's a linkages between those strategies. You take you know this disability strategy won't just stand on its yeah. own. There, there are links with the anti-poverty strategy there. Thank you, Robin. You want to make a comment on this point? Yeah, I think you've been reading my notes, Chair. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> Again? <laughs> that telepathy we have? It's just, just, just the, I suppose, the education tied into it. Yes. 
and indeed, uh, as Mr. McCann was raising about the active ageing strategy, that health was tied into yes. it. But I think if yeah. and our older people's forums, which have been established, um, is very much our department working with public health agency with the Department of Health around that, around that engagement with older people, meeting the needs of older people. Okay, thank you. Sinead? Thank you, Chair. No, it's just a quick question on the, uh, you mentioned the capital spend, and um, that a large proportion of that, or the majority of that, is, is earmarked for housing. Um, I'm just wondering what, what are the other, what, what, uh, what other priorities do the uh, capital priorities does the <coughs> department have outside of housing, and what's the, you know, a general budget for those other priorities outside of housing? Well, I suppose that would include, if I chip in there, mm -hmm. that would include our urban regeneration. It would include sports um, and any capital bills around really across our broad portfolio of work mm -hmm. uh, and any schemes that are, are proposed within that. But urban regeneration, um, uh, regional, sub-regional, stadia, all of those would be in the capital. Yes. Anything else? Oh. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, Carol? Um, thanks very much for the overview. <clears throat> I mean, there, there were two successful court cases challenging um, the former Department for Communities on a lack of a, or even the executive thought matter, on a lack of an anti poverty strategy and also for an Irish language strategy, so they have to go ahead regardless. <coughs> However, it's good that they're in the new decade, new approach. But these strategies that are housed within DFC are executive strategies. So even after the budget statement yesterday, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we're just working on the assumption that the money allocated, while it's negative now, hopefully will change for the better after the statement. But the, I suppose the question I have um, is that I appreciate that other agencies will be involved in bringing these strategies forward, but I have to say, my own experience as a neighbourhood renewal worker 15, 20 years ago, whenever I came out, wasn't good. I, the statutory partnerships, the statutory bodies let the community sector down and let residents down big time, and they continued to do it annually. And those who did go to the partnerships and did it well, work groups like Housing Executive and others, but um, once you got to, for example, um, you know, health or others, it was quite patchy. So it is really essential that the co-production, co-design element, that is factored into it, but it needs to be grassroots groups as well, because some of the big voluntary groups do not speak for the community and voluntary sector. And I'm telling you that now they don't, okay? They have an appreciation. They have an overview, but they don't have lived experience on a lot of these issues that are crucial. So the question I have is, in the co-production and co-design, for example, of neighbourhood renewal, and I've heard it mentioned before, will it be specifically linked to anti-poverty and outcomes-based approaches for any new programme for government? And can we ensure that, you know, neighbourhood renewal partnerships are reflective of the Quindian voluntary sector, but where possible, even political representation. Because what happens is, I'm not saying they need to be involved in the nitty gritty, but say unless you're involved in your neighbourhood renewal partnership in your own area, it could pass you by. Or if you're involved in the work that areas at risk are involved in, it could pass you by until there's a problem. And as people with mandates, we need to ensure that the democracy is as free-flowing and as on the ground as possible. Because at times, in my opinion, there have been gatekeepers, both within the community and family <coughs> sector, albeit very few, but certainly within statutory bodies, and gatekeeping to an effect that they stifled the real impact and effect that these funds should have had on the ground. So, I mean, we all know the Minister of our background, working class girl, um, and all the rest, but she can't do the work of everybody in your department, and it's really crucial that you all hear that message. And, and Minister has made that very clear to us, that she wants That's these based. strategies to take on board the views of people who are experiencing 
poverty or who have a disability. She's very mindful that that's how we should go about this. Um, and that's why we, we have a focus on those subgroups, supporting those, those co-design groups to engage with individuals who are living in poverty, <coughs> engage with those who are working with, it, with individuals in poverty, so that the, the strategy is evidence-based, that we have the evidence of what is required and then the actions that are needed to address that. And neighbourhood renewal partnerships are key to that, but we also have large areas of poverty and, and incidences of poverty outside of our neighbourhood Absolutely. rural areas that must Absolutely. be reflected within this. So we look at in our border areas and our rural <coughs> areas, we have, we have significant issues of poverty in those areas. So we need to go beyond our neighbourhood renewal partnerships in terms of that engagement. And, and, and that's why I mentioned or is at risk, Beverly, yes, because it's, it's, it's really yes. crucial. Like, for example, um, some commentary on the news is that the rural development um, doesn't take into impact, or sorry, doesn't take into effect the impact of poverty in, on women living in rural communities. I mean, you've raised this, yes. chair, yeah. but it doesn't. There's no specific measures yeah. for women in rural communities. So there's an example where this anti-poverty strategy, on behalf of the executive, will certainly, you know, I imagine have connections with the Minister for Economy, the Minister for Environment and Rural Development, but even the, the research we received really on food poverty, mm. the presentations we've received from the Cliff Edge Coalition, the Cliff, when we went to some of that UCOS around universal credit, and it's clear that there's been strong engagement, it's participative democracy at its best, it's led by people who have had the lived experience. It's those sorts of relationships and partnerships that need to be... We need to build those. Absolutely. Thank you. OK, thanks, Carol. Robin? Not sure. Nope, you got yours you, covered? You, you, okay. you read my notes. <laughs> OK, members, there's no other questions at this time on that part. Do you want to do a change? We'll that? do a swap. Yes, that'd be fine. So, as I've said previously, Alison covers transformation, comms and engagement, and Karen is governance and commercial services. So, we turn first of all, with your permission, to transform, transformation, comms and engagement, and that director is responsible for a number of our key central services within the department. Um, the, the directorate works with minister and provides support through the private office and her day-to-day -day role and serves as a link between the department and the assembly through the DALO and AQ coordination roles. They also provide support to the permanent secretary and departmental management board. But as well as this, the directorate supports the minister with a range of media services delivered through our press office. And this includes the department's Twitter account, which with more than 12,700 followers is a valuable resource for sharing public information and news about the minister and the work of the department and support and, and, and uh, signposting for uh, individuals who are interacting with and the public who are interacting with the department. Directorate is also responsible for the department's public information campaigns and internal communications to our staff. They manage the Jobs and Benefits Facebook page, which is about 6,000 followers, and that promotes the works of the Jobs and Benefit Office network, including the promotion of job and training opportunities, job centre online, job fairs and local employer events. An example of a current public information campaign is the Make the Call campaign and also digital information campaigns for child maintenance and universal credit. Looking specifically at the Make the Call campaign and the impact that has had, um, this generated in 1819 an additional 37.1 million in annual benefits for 7,765 people, which has made those um, recipients better off on average by £92 a week. And while that figure is not purely due to the advertising campaign. <coughs> the previous TV advertising campaign accounted for an average of 21% of the calls to that make the call service during the periods of activities. The directorate has also oversight of the department's people action plan and our cultural transformation programme. And the people action plan focuses on creating a positive workplace culture 
and developing our people to perform well. And initiatives that I've mentioned include the uh, Social Welfare Summer School, which I spoke about earlier, as well as employer-supported volunteering initiatives for staff, together with specific leadership programmes. So we've developed an evolved leadership programme, which aims to help create develop and support future le le leaders at all levels within our organisation. The DFC cultural programme will be aligned to our corporate strategy and that corporate strategy has been developed by um, officials and is currently with Minister for Consideration which looks at a five-year view of the department aligned to uh, the programme for government aligned to Minister's priorities. And um, that strategy will very much guide the work we do to support ministers' priorities and support delivery of the programme for government. So work is ongoing to, to deliver that once we once we secured ministerial approval for that, and then the cultural transfer, for transformation programme to support our people and the business plan to support our business areas and guide our business areas and how we deliver on that. No further. Um, information to give you on our transformation comms and engagement, unless there are any questions. Just a couple of questions on that. Um, uh, I, I know and I have made mention of the, make, the call campaign in a previous uh, uh, committee meeting here and just how wonderful they are and I, I just want to put that on record again. It's been absolutely great and I noticed that the, the campaign has started again on TV. I've seen several of the adverts for it and actually it, it's, it's good as well at the moment because we as MLAs receive letters about the BBC TV licence and about um, people and pension, um, pension credits and all of those things. So we're now saying, okay, we, we, we'll say to to people when they ask us, you need to phone that number and make that call to see what you're entitled to. So it has worked out at a good time for that, uh, you know, for those letters coming through and hitting the doorsteps for many um, older people. So that's that's really good. Um, your Twitter and Facebook, I, I, yeah, you either loathe or you like uh, any form of social media, and um, and I know that it's widely used now and it's great and we see that. It's just um, with that, do. You, I know a lot of it can only be read only, and you can't write, and you can't do, and you can't ask. Um, do, do is that the way yours is, or can people ask questions, or can there be interaction, or what way does that work with yeah, your? Well, we your would get media? feed from um, the Twitter account. People will pass yeah. comments, and we will monitor that and respond. Um, if, if there are queries raised, we will certainly respond on that. I'll and then the also with the Facebook account, it is for all the jobs and benefits offices okay. and we have a person that would monitor those and would post and keep an eye on any comments about on the Facebook account. And then I suppose that's a way then between the offices of sharing knowledge. Yes, exactly. Um, because yes. sometimes, I mean, I know I worked for the statutory sector for many years, and sometimes something can throw you a curveball um, that other offices may not have had before that issue, and then all of a sudden that happens, and that is a good reference point, I suppose, for that as well. Yeah, and, and people are, are people travel, so there might be a job fair on in an area that maybe they that's not their local jobs and benefits office. So it is raising that profile and awareness of what all we are doing. Okay. Okay. Um, just let me see. Have we got Fra. And it's just a following on from it uh, because I think it's it, it, it's interesting. Obviously, in today's age, social media is a, a crucial element of, of of getting through to people. Uh, but there there are still uh, quite a number of people who uh, don't buy into uh, the, the the computers or social media or mobile phones, yeah. and, and a, a lot of it rests among the elderly. And uh, it, it's, has there, is there any thought there has been given? Has there, I'm just a reason because there are organisations out there and, uh, that, that have daily contact uh, with pensioners, with uh, people with disabilities, with things. And uh, are they used to, 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 uh, to, to try and draw people out in terms of. So, so if I look, for example, at the Older People's um, Network, which we um, support. We're keen that that network has recently developed, but what we're keen to do is use that um, network better to pass public information messages and support messages to our staff and for the likes of the Make the Call team to attend that network, um, but also three other organisations that we're working through, like Advice NI, to ensure that they have those, if you like, that public information available so that when people come to them and um, you know other organisations that we do work with. Um, like Age and I, that we work with them more proactively to ensure that that information gets out for See, those who don't have access to the likes of Facebook or, or don't use. In terms of more locally, yeah. Yeah. I know that 
Yeah. Uh, right, and the, certainly in urban areas, in many urban areas, but also in rural areas, you have the, the rays over this past number of years of the Good Morning groups. Uh, yeah. and the yeah. Good Morning West yeah. Belfast, Good Morning yeah. Carl, yeah. Uh, Carl. Yeah. And I can just give you a wee mention there, Carl. You know. Or Duff Ryan. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the, and uh, they, they be in daily contact about yeah. prescriptions, about wake ups, oh, about. Absolutely. And, and uh, they, they could play a crucial role. Oh, absolutely. And that's something we we'll certainly take on board working yeah. across the department. For if you take, for example, our, our housing associations, yeah. many of them in supported <clears throat> housing schemes would have a yes. call scheme for, um, you know, a morning call for residents within those schemes. And that's certainly something we'll take away and look at how we can uh, you know use those and work collaboratively with our partners say in housing associations housing excited of how we can get that information out. we'll look at that okay uh, mark oh, thank you chair and thanks ladies <laughs> it was just a small one there on the make the call and it's good to hear that it sounds like it's been uh, successful and, and, and the success of it is going is there any analysis done in obviously a geographical breakdown of where the calls are coming from is there anywhere in particular where there's a poor or, or, or lower up on the surface I don't have that information to hand, but I am sure the team will have that oh. of, of the coverage of the service and happy to provide that to you. It's just that I remember yes. in the early days mm -hmm. no, of, of the initiative, that yeah. the, 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 was the case that it was like yeah, I'd be confident. I'd be area. confident we have that information and I will get that so to you. Can yeah. f focus that resource in those areas locally to uh, generate interest and activity, I suppose. Thank okay. You. All right. Want to okay. move on to our next yes. part then? So finally, we have Governance and Commercial Services Directorate, and this directorate provides a central function to support the delivery of and compliance with governance frameworks and to manage public appointments. The team also manages a number of commercial contracts that support the operation and delivery of the department's services. And this includes managing the contracts for the delivery of health assessments. So one co contract with Capita covers uh, personal independence payments, and another with ATOS covers universal credit and employment and support alliance. Northern Ireland Audit Office are currently conducting an independent audit of the department's delivery and management of the PIP assessment service contract, and that report is anticipated, anticipated to be finalised around May. Um, we've also appointed uh, Mary Kavanagh to carry out the second independent statutory review of the personal independence payment assessment process, <coughs> and this will include the role performed by Capita, and our expectation is that that work, that report will be ready around June time. Um, contracts with Capita and ATOS will run until July 2021, and the Minister is currently considering how health assessments will be delivered beyond this point. Um, we can update the committee further on this following Minister's decision on that. Um, the team, is, it's fair to say, the team is also managing two projects aligned to that. So, one is a health transformation project to ensure continuity of health assessments beyond the current contract expiry in July 2021. And they're engaging with DWP uh, to uh, and working closely with them to understand that plan program of work, the impacts for the departments and its customers, and options for delivery of this program of work will, will be with Minister and brought to Minister for her consideration. Another team is working with DWP to deliver the future method of payment project, and that project aims to migrate customers from payment exception services including those who currently use a post office card account, to mainstream accounts where possible, and to ensure that a replacement payment exception service is made available to those who need it once current contracts end in November 2021. Um, the Department is working closely with DWP who are leading in this, and it is their contract are leading in this programme of work, and continuing to engage with and provide support to those impacted by the change. So actions being taken by the DWP by DWP on this are that they have a freefold helpline available to customers mm -hmm. to make that change from exception services. But then through our own department, we're taking forward a raft of measures to support that work, 
So that includes the Make the Call campaign. Again, customers can make direct um, contact through that. We can offer support in our jobs directly in our jobs and benefits offices. We have made MLAs and DWP has written to MLAs and we're also happy and Karen and her team would be happy to go out to MLAs if they want a more detailed discussion on how we can support people to make that transfer. Um, we're also, our next Order People's Network session I think is in June and we're intended to engage at that session with that network around advising and offering support on making that transfer. And um, tomorrow, actually, officials are meeting with AGNI to understand if there's any other help or support that we can, can be provided through them. So, Chair, that's okay, thank a you. very quick run through our responsibilities. That's grand. Um, Carol? Um, just one of declaring interest, just in terms of the former Minister for Decal. So, a couple of things. I mean, no. Corporate governance framework yes. is critical, and there's obviously the audit report yes. in relation to sport and audit, so we'll come, come back to that. A couple of issues I have in relation to this is the management of the appointments to arm's length bodies, and how we're going to make it easier for people who aren't former civil servants, aren't former chair of orchestras or operas, are more um, reflective of the community. How do we get them as on the ALBs? That's one. The other issue I have is um, in relation to post offices, they're still a reserved matter. Are post offices? They're, I think they are. Which aspect of post office? What's that? Which aspect of post office? Well, actually, the the, the ownership of post offices, but the concern I have is that, you know, we have been lobbied as an assembly to save local post offices, mm -hmm. and if DWP are actually, it would appear that they're moving from post office cards, then that that will be a big concern for a lot of us. Um, I think the other aspect is, um, the, uh, and I've said this before, and we all have. Uh, the privatisation of capita, of the, a public function to a body like capita, in my opinion, has been disastrous, as has ATOS and the rest. Uh, given the fact that over 60% of people who apply their PIPs assessment are paid overturned, and I'm actually increasingly getting um, calls and meeting with with those who help people fill in PIP, PIP forms, applications. The feedback is <coughs> that on appeal there is shock, if not distress, at the experience that applicants have had to endure in the assessments. We have said before they have been described as humiliating. And it's not to say that People set out deliberately to humiliate others, but there is something wrong with the process that needs fixed. Fixed, and maybe Marie Kavanagh's work will, un you know, do something with that, or make a comment on it or recommendations. I'd be surprised if it didn't. And you say the minister is coming back to have a look at that, but it's just to have it in the record. There are too many people. It's not an urban myth. No, it's not. It's just too many people coming to us and. Um, People who apply for a PIP, it has the least fraud of any benefit. Um, and for people to go through that process to get their PIP award, it is in itself arduous. But the journey of getting their award, particularly if they've had to pay, um, has been horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And I don't think anybody deliberately sets out to do that on someone else. I'm just working on the assumption that's not the case. But the system's broken. Capita, the way they're operating this system, is broken. And the amount of complaints from what was privatised from DSD to Capita has increased in my experience. And I've been here from 2007. And it's not, it's, it's getting worse. It really is. So it's, I know there's a lot there. And I know you sort of take all this on board. And I'm sure you have heard it before. But it is really, really concerning. 
I'll respond on the public appointments yeah. and the post office, and if Karen then comes in after me on, mm -hmm. on PEP. Mm -hmm. um, the public appointments, that's something I know that the Commissioner for Public Appointments is very keen that we, we get a, a wider representation and a, and a representation on our boards and our uh, and, and boards of gender disabilities boards. as well as class um, and, and something certainly within you know we've talked about earlier about a gender equality strategy we've talked mm -hmm. about a disability strategy and certainly something that I think there's work can be done within the development of those to support the work around ensuring that our, our public appointments have a wider representation of the people they're re re representing. Um, the post office, um, I need to come back to you on the, on, on the whether that's reserved, I'm, I'm not clear on that, but certainly on the use of post office, so bank accounts, 99% of bank accounts, individuals who have a bank account, can use a post office to withdraw money, to make lodgements mm -hmm. uh, and to transfer money through those. So the post offices, those who, who rely on and use our post office would we continue to do so. Uh, when we move from the post office cards account, when we, when we move to that future method of payment, Karen. yeah, I mean that, that that would certainly be the intention. And just to, just to talk about the um, ca uh, the um, commercial arrangements around post office card accounts as well, and um, and maybe just to set the context of where we are and, and why we're um, undertaking that campaign, that might that might help. Um, the contracting authority with post office limit. Is with DWP and DFC as a contracted or as an authorised user of that contract. So the department's intention is to continue to avail of that contract for mm -hmm. as long as the contract exists. Um, we are going through a process of trying to migrate customers onto mainstream accounts where we can, um, because what we don't want to do is reach a cliff edge point whenever mm -hmm. um, the contract with DWP and Post runs Office out. Limited runs out. Yeah. So we're trying to transition, but we want to look at how we can support people during that transition. Um, it's certainly not the intent of the department to be causing distress, and we do want to support people through that process. And that's why we're really keen that we are engaging with the Older People's Forum and AJNI and political representatives and anybody else who can um, feed back to us in terms of how we can put in additional support mechanisms for that to happen. Um, in terms of the future solution going forward, um, should a customer, for example, not have migrated onto a mainstream account by the time the contract ends, it's likely that they will migrate onto the new replacement payment exception service. Um, we don't know for sure what that payment exception service is going to look like until we go out to market. Okay. Um, but it's highly likely that that is going to be a voucher-based solution, which is similar to the other exception service that we have in place at the moment. Um, so we are trying to encourage people so that they, they don't become reliant on the voucher payment. Um, much as that will work, and will <coughs> provide access maybe to even broader beyond post office um, um, areas for encouragement that we get them in the mainstream account so that they still have that um, opportunity to go to the post office. And we know that there's that social interaction and engagement that happens in the yeah. post office, and it's very central to, to people's routines yeah. um, and, and, and beyond that. Um, so we are very conscious of it, and we're more than happy to work with anybody um, who, who has ideas in terms of the additional support that's needed. Um, we're happy to conduct home visits with people who are, are maybe unsure of how to navigate through the process as well, and that can be arranged through our, our make a call service also. Okay. Yeah, just uh, Clerk has brought up here reserve matters on one of the uh, state's telecommunications and postage, but I don't know how. Yeah. Um, I'll take, not much I'll take more that than that. Away, yeah, on that up. issue. Okay. Just remember previous debates that we had yeah. in the Assembly, and we were told. Uh, post Office is Royal Mail, it's a private yeah. company. Um, <laughs> At the end of the day, they will consult on the closure of a post office, and I mean we've all had campaigns, and uh, at the end of the day, they will make their decision. On and that not. contract, that post office card account, is a contract that DWP have with post office currently. Yeah. 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 And pre-market engagement. Sorry, pre-market engagement done with. Um, but the market so far has indicated that there isn't a like-for-like -like service. Pocket was established, I yeah. think it was 2006. There isn't a like-for-like -like replacement that we can put yeah, in, so it will right. be a different solution. <coughs> so we're looking at, well, how can we, 
How can we take people on that different yeah. journey? I suppose it's to remember also this is not just a rural issue, this is very much an urban, urban issue as well. Of course. You know, where the, that is, and it's just that you say it's, yeah. a, it's that to combat social isolation as well, Indeed. Um, where people are actually um, going into, you know, that small community that they live in, and that's part of the hub of, of their, their weekly or fortnightly jaunt out, you know. Uh, if Kelly wants to make a small point on this, yeah, and then Fra as well. I appreciate that the post office arrangements are DWP. However, um, I'll just give you an example of one thing. I've, I have many constituents in my area who are really losing the will to live. Having house appointments are not going to help them because the banks are not accepting them. Are you going to put on transport to get them to the nearest bank, which for some of my constituents is in excess of 25 miles away? Um, also, the banks are turned down, in particular rural older women who have never driven, haven't got a passport, and their utility bills are in their husband's names. Mm -hmm. So have you actually engaged with the banks? I know that um, Eddie Lynch, the older person's commissioner, has a regular meeting with the banks. The banks don't give a hoot about older people. Um, you know, this, this move from post offices sounds wonderful, and the intention is has to be there because DWP are pulling out of them. Um, but I have to say, the banks are not helping here. Um, there are no alternative options for many of my constituents. All the banks pulled out. I begged the Department of the Economy when we were sitting in 2016 to do something about that stopping banks pulling out of rural areas. They didn't do, they weren't able to do anything. Banks took financial decisions. I now have one bank that appears, a truck that appears down the peninsula. Um, and people are afraid to use it in case they get robbed coming out of it because everybody knows you're going to the bank. Mm -hmm. um, but I just have to say, what discussions are there with banks here? Because they are not easily, it's not easy to get a bank account, especially if you are an older woman. Uh, and I know certainly this is this is an area that DWP have been working with the um, Emerging Payments Association with. So I think there's something like 150 banking and payment organisations involved there. Um, so those conversations are happening at that national level. Um, but I, I think that's why it's important that um, you know, the post office is able to you, you know, to avail of the, the uh, mainstream accounts, that they're able to use them in their, their post office so that they're not reliant on the geography. But I take the point You can't get an account open. Of, okay. And that's why it's really important. I know they don't do basic. I, I just have a concern that there's this fallacy that what we all can use is not what an 85 year old can use. And they're being turned away from banks. Yeah, having accounts. And, and that's why it's, it's essential that we continue to have a payment exception service okay. available. Okay. Um, and, you know, th there's no intention to have, to not have an alternative for okay. people who can't access bank accounts because we appreciate that there are older, there are vulnerable people, there are people who aren't able to manage an account. Um, so we need to make sure that we have a support there and that there's no disruption to, the, to their benefits. Um, and that's why we will continue to have a payment exception service, but it will be an alternative to the post office card account because it won't exist. Yes, it won't exist. Yeah. I think that there was a process put in place, just very quickly, Chair, sorry, um, at the time that the Children's um, Trust funds were bail being brought out by government, where bank accounts were set up for people, and then they could continue on using the post office, of course. Um, is something like that going to be, is that the type of thing that you're talking about, the alternative? I know you've talked about the vouchers, but... <laughs> It's looking like the replacement that will be procured will be a voucher-based solution. Um, there's no signal that it will be anything other than that at this moment in time. Okay. If that changes, um, we'll, of course, keep everybody updated on that. But that's looking like the solution that's out there on the market. Thank you. Taking on board your point about um, the older persons commissioner's engagement with banks, yeah. um, that's something we look at after mm -hmm. today. It's can we engage in those meetings with the older persons commissioner? Can we engage with Eddie in some of those meetings with the banks? Yeah. Just to reiterate. It's why this co production is so <coughs> important, because unless you're faced with that yeah. situation. Thank you. Okay, Fry, you want to make a point? Yeah, sure. And it's uh, just a, 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 first of all, the way of a comment. We've all seen the, uh, the behaviour of banks and how they've deal, dealt with people over this past uh, quite a number of years. And I wouldn't hold my breath that they would get in. Uh, just uh, the two points. I, I actually thought, that, as Robin did, uh, the post office split up in the number of different and post office counters looks after the, 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 uh, the, the post offices uh, as we know them. 
and uh, the, there, there's long been an argument, you know, that that's post offices are not just about paying people money, but social interaction. Yeah. Uh, they're about thing, and uh, the, I agree with you that they can't have an effect uh, on uh, urban areas. But their their biggest loss is in rural areas. You know, once it goes, it starts to demise of villages and small towns and things like that. And that's been long the argument, but we've never really been able to get our heads around how 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 we do that. And it's the same as as, as many much out of town shopping. You know that uh, if it goes there, then people can't make it. And I, uh, and I, but the, the, I think the, 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 the other aspect of, uh, of this, and, and uh, I, 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 I don't know, uh, is there a, a charge at, uh, by a banking organisation uh, for people who will get their money or, uh, put into the thing at all? You know that, uh, or uh, is it if, it? if there is, is it different from the post office? I know post most office post offices enjoy. Uh, the, the, the people getting their money because it means that people's going to spend locally, they're going to spend things. But if you go to a bank, banks will not usually take on anything like this uh, free of charge. We'll, we'll take that away. Okay, we're going to move on. We've got Mark sure. Kelly and Robin. Sorry, Robin, you want to make on that point as well? No, no. 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 Oh, sorry, I'm, you're, you're, I'm just not down the list. Yeah, you are down the right. list, I'm afraid. Um, I've got Mark Kelly and then Robin. So, Mark. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just first, I concur entirely with Carl's uh, remarks around the, the health assessments and, and then of the contracts coming at the end. And, Summer 2021, that won't be long coming, I remember. Mm -hmm. I think it was on DST committee at the time when mm -hmm. the ATOS contract was coming to an end and there was people were excited, but we seem to have gone from frying pan to fire <laughs> to, you know, w w w with the, the, the move to capita. So we, we would certainly be keen to hear the ministers and departments fuse ASAP because, like I say, it, it won't be long uh, coming. <coughs> In terms of the post office uh, accounts, which is what I was going to come on, you, you'll know we've put in a couple of questions in this, <laughs> in the hope that I'll get an answer that I understand okay. <laughs> and can then re relate to the many concerned uh, people who are coming to me about it, many of whom are elderly, others are like, children or offspring of elderly uh, p parents. There is, uh, and uh, I don't think Kelly was over dramatising things at all. Really there is <laughs> genuine uh, concern, and if not panic, uh, out there about this. P people have been basically told by banks, no, we, we don't want you. Yeah. No, we, we can't give you that. And, and it's something that's causing a, a lot of distress. I uh, appreciate the work is ongoing and there's uncertainty at your end uh, as well. Uh, in, in terms of the interaction with the older persons commissioner and, and other groups, I would advise that uh, anything coming out of that is, is publicised by the department and relayed to MLAs. And it's so, so, so we're given a kind of digestible and re repeatable <laughs> advice to, to pass on uh, to people as well. Uh, like I say, it, it's, it's, it's genuinely hard to understate how big of an issue this is in my own constituency. Maybe I have a post office next door to my constituency office. Uh, maybe that's what, what makes it so big there. And if it would help, you know, if, if, if the answers to the questions that you're getting aren't answering your question sufficiently for you, more than happy to meet with you and have a conversation yeah. um, if that would be beneficial. Um, and we can, we can Yeah, and in terms of we'll contact with people and, and the groups that you are engaged and what they have undertaken uh, to engage with in order to help disseminate information uh, out to groups. What about with post offices or the post office them themselves? Because that's where, where the most people are, are probably asking and that's why they're being told they'll call yeah. them next door yeah. and ask Mark yeah. Durkin about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, so, so, yeah. so they can give that sort of simple step by step reassure people oh you'll still be able to come in here to get your money out or yeah a, a checklist of what they might need to set up an account a lot of which is impossible for some of these people but yet anyway um and that is absolutely an important source of provision of information for people um so we have undertaken a pilot with dwp where um, Post Office Limited um, are working to have those informed conversations with people coming in. Um, so there are um, four offices, um, post offices, where 
that engagement um, is happening at the minute. They're being given um, information packs. Um, the, the staff and the post office are talking people through the process. So that's going to be evaluated, and if, if, if that is proving the benefit that we would anticipate that it would, then um, we would be looking then to extend that out. Um, I know that um, Post Office Limited um, are providing information, and I know that will not reach everybody, but on their, their website, through posters and things like that. Um, but hopefully this pilot will provide then the evidence that, that um, can support a rollout of that going forward. It's difficult to control and manage the information as well, I suppose, like, depending on who's working in the exactly. post office. Someone will say, they're trying to close us down. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Someone will say, oh, you're, 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 you're screwed. Or someone will be more reassuring yeah. you know, and, and, and helpful, yeah. but it, it's difficult to manage. <laughs> Just think about that every time you send an email. OK, thank you, members. Have you finished there, Mark? Yeah? Yeah. yeah that's Kelly? I was, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm not going to talk about the post office again. It's very frustrating for me, but I, I don't, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go back to Capita. Um, I appreciate that that contract is due to come up in 2021. Mm -hmm. Could you confirm for me um, how much um, ability will the department have to amend the contract with who the, or before the contract is issued to the future provider? Um, there are some things that we can certainly learn from the Capita contract. For instance, um, the eternal, internal audits that are completed within Capita staff that change points that have been awarded by the person who was out doing the assessment with no rhyme or reason to those. Um, there, there are just certain things that, that, that I'm concerned about that we don't keep replicating. Um, so I'm just wondering, when the terms and conditions are being drawn up for the new contract, um, will there be co-production and co-design in that? Will we take learning from what the bad things that have happened with Capita, the good things that have happened with Capita? How much flexibility do we have with that contract? Okay, so just on that, um, in terms of what happens after the end of this contract, it's still to be determined by Minister. Okay. Um, okay. If we are going back out to market on that, um, we do define the um, specification okay. that, that will go into the procurement. Obviously, that needs to be cognizant of um, the PIP assessment guide and um, the legislation that we're operating under. Um, but what we, what we do is, with all of our contracts before we go out, um, and especially where we have um, shared contract arrangements with DWP, we make sure that we are looking at the previous contract, learning from that, and, and how we can benefit. Um, if we are going out to um, market again on that in terms of the co-production and co-design, um, we have to move on this within the next few weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there isn't the scope for us to go out and do a, a, a consultation as such in terms of um, how we would shape up the contract. However, NIAO are producing um, a report um, on the management and the con and the delivery of the contract, and I think that would provide useful independent insight in terms of lessons that need to be learned and brought forward into any future contract. However, I, I do need to stress that ministers currently consider options moving forward. So, um, I just I'm um, really concerned that we don't have to, if it means holding it back. Just the way, and you can keep me right in this, the way that contracts normally work is there's a period of time that the contract's out on offer, yes. and you know the, all that green book stuff that has to happen. Yes. I personally believe that there is actually time for consultation there. We're only talking about 12 weeks. Um, but I think that there would be time. I, I would rather see that consultation done so we don't have the same stuff going forward that we're all concerned about. Um, maybe we could get something back on that, Chair, because I, I would be concerned that something so vital as that assessment, but that we don't have enough time to consult and, and for us to scrutinise that? I think what would be helpful is if we come back once we yeah. um, have a, a, a steer from Minister in terms okay. of how we move forward. Um, and I, our intention <coughs> at that stage would be to come back and pr um, provide information to committee. And I think we can take stock of where we are at that stage. Okay. Um, so, because we, we obviously are not moving on any procurement in the absence of any decision on Minister. Because yeah. um, it's a year... Forward. I know it's not a full year and a half, but it's, it's well over a year. Obviously, the Minister will make her decision on whether she wants to extend that contract or do a new one or whatever it may be. But I still think there's time to consult. Um, if, if we were um, to go out to market again, um, we would need to be moving into transition from one supplier to another from January to February next year. Yeah. There would be a six-month lead-in time. Um, so you would be looking at a contract award would need to be completed 
by the end of the year, early January. Um, and you would be looking to um, go out to market in the next few weeks on that. And can I just double check, does that mean then that because it's a transfer, if, if it goes that way, that it goes to a different company or continue to be a place? Yes. So we get this, keep the same assessors and the same managers? Um, I think that's going to be a challenge for the department, <laughs> whether or we go out to market or not, okay. um, because there's going to be chippy obligations, um, and I think that, that and that's a key consideration. Um, you know, there's a significant number of staff that would need to be chippied. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just can I... You're at, you're at next anyway. There you are. You're yes, next. Sir? Oh, are you? No, you're no, not. not. You've already spoken. It's just a small point. Do I make? Go ahead. Sorry, it's Robin there. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. I love you. <laughs> the most important thing here is, is getting it right. Yeah. I, I think, as Kelly says, rather than getting it rushed. Yeah. You know, uh, so yes. I don't know what cost would be attached to getting it right in terms of potentially, <laughs> I have to be careful how I phrase this, extending the current contract that, you know, that none of us are particularly uh, happy with quite the opposite, actually, but to ensure that we have time to get a new contract, right? Yeah. Um, and we have um, we have challenges there from, um, from a procurement law perspective in terms of um, where we go with this. So I think the best thing for us to do would be to update you once yeah. we work through this with Minister, if that would be agreeable to the committee. Yeah, and just a point to do with the staff and the Tupé and that's I mean, we have a lot of staff there who come from professional backgrounds that are carrying out these, mm -hmm. and they have they have a code of ethics and, with, with, to do with their own um, uh, professional mm -hmm. uh, development that yes. they have to follow. So um, it just would, it, it, it's not necessarily that you know if if it goes to a new contractor that the same staff there may be the same problems. That's not necessarily the, the case there as well. Should be, but would obviously be a key consideration, yeah, and it, it's something that we need to factor in whether or not all those staff decide to chip across. It's another yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward then to, to getting back to us on that one then as well. Okay, Robin. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm like uh, Mark. I, I have a post office directly across the road from my office. Frequently get people sent across. Go and speak to your MLA. Um, and I know it's not in your belly, it's not in your gift, but if you want to try and understand, as Mr McCann made the remarks, if you want to try and understand the value of a post office to an area, when first the post office goes and then the bank goes, well, if you look at uh, Dundonald Village and the death, demise of Dundonald Village, then you'll see the implications for an area of what happens when those two services are indeed uh, removed. But that's a comment rather than a... You'd mentioned about the work being done uh, by Mary Kavanagh and the report that she's pre producing. Could you perhaps go into a bit more detail on what she's being asked to do and who she will report to and what the final uh, outcomes you would hope of that report? Okay. So I, I will provide as much information as I can, but I'm caveating that. Um, because I'm coming from the commercial aspect of it. Uh, um, a lot of this detail is in the operational side. Um, but um, I know that um, she has commissioned evidence gathering at the moment. Um, obviously, there was the previous um, Raider review, um, and at that time, um, there was a commitment that a second independent review would look at what had the, the department implemented out of those recommendations and also you know with the evidence called there will be other observations that will be made and at that time the intention was that the report would be laid as far as I, I'm aware to the assembly that that was um, what what had been committed to um, but we can certainly um, get the terms of reference for you and, and share those with the committee if that would be helpful yeah I think that would be helpful chair if that would Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, no other members indicated to speak. So that's okay. it. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We thank you. know from your briefing, you'll not be too long thank before you're back in front of us again. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. I said the boys upstairs. I said you'll need to. I have loads. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to move on to item number seven, which is the departmental briefing on legislative consent motion the Westminster Pension Schemes Bill. Here we go. Let's go on ahead up to the table. Uh, members, the papers for this agenda item are page 575. Um, can I invite back with us Anna Cleary, Jerry McCann and Doreen Roy. Um, thank you for coming today. I'll just let you get settled. And then, Anne, is it yourself you're going to yep. go sure. ahead? Okay. Um, I'll begin by, as ever, thank, thanking you, Chair, for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, members will be aware that, subject to the necessary approvals, it's anticipated that an Assembly Bill corresponding to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2017 relating to Master Trusts will be brought forward shortly. However, today we're not talking about that. We're talking about the Westminster Pension Schemes Bill, which is currently before Parliament. Uh, we're very pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today about that bill and in particular the proposed legislative consent motion. We've provided the committee with fairly comprehensive written briefing on the bill, including a draft of the legislative consent memorandum. If the committee is content, uh, I'll briefly run through the main provisions of the bill. I think it's fair to say that the bill has consumer protection at its heart. It aims to help people plan for the future and to protect people's pensions by giving the pensions regulator greater powers to tackle irresponsible management of pension schemes, including actions by employers that would compromise the viability of the pension scheme. In summary, firstly, the bill makes provision for collective money purchase schemes, also known as CDC, collective defined contribution schemes, where contributions into a scheme are pooled and invested to deliver an aspired level of benefit. This builds upon and facilitates the initiative by Royal Mail and the Communication Workers Union, which have concluded that one of this type of scheme, a CDC scheme, would offer better outcomes for the workforce than a traditional money purchase scheme. Second thing. It strengthens protection for scheme members by giving the pensions regulator stronger powers so that savers can be confident that their pensions are protected and that the regulator is better able to take action if pensions are put at risk. Members will be aware of several recent high-profile insolvency cases where employers have failed to give proper weight to their responsibilities to their defined pension, sorry, defined benefit pension schemes. This bill seeks to address this in a range of ways. For example, a requirement on those responsible for corporate transactions to set out how <coughs> they will mitigate any adverse impact on the pension scheme, and by enhancing the regulator's information gathering powers and its powers to ensure that those responsible for schemes comply with pensions le legislation. There will also be new <coughs> sanctions on those who willfully or recklessly harm their pension scheme, including a maximum seven-year prison sentence and a civil penalty of up to £1 million. Pounds. Thirdly, the Bill increases transparency about individuals' pension savings by producing a framework for online pensions dashboards to improve information for savers so they can prepare for retirement. Fourthly, it delivers a clearer scheme funding standards in defined benefit schemes and strengthens the regulator's enforcement of the improved system. This is particularly important in changing the defined benefit landscape, <laughs> with many schemes closed to new members or future accruals. The aim is to help trustees improve their scheme funding and investment decisions and to manage potential risk. The Bill introduces new powers to protect pension savings to help scheme trustees ensure transfers of pension savings are made to safe and not fraudulent schemes. It also ensures the Pension Protection Fund can continue to administer compensation appropriately. And finally, amends the definition of administration charges to make clear which costs are covered by that definition. Now, although pensions is a devolved matter, in general, 
pensions policy and legislation here operate in line with corresponding <coughs> pension provision in England, Scotland and Wales, in line with section 87 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. In addition, the pensions regulator, the pensions ombudsman and the pension protection fund all operate on a UK-wide basis. The Northern Ireland provisions were included in the Bill in the absence of the Executive and Functioning Assembly in order to ensure that what is in effect a single system of pensions can continue to function. As many schemes operating here are also UK-wide schemes, it's highly desirable that the same regulatory framework is in place here within the same time frame as in Britain to facilitate compliance, planning and enforcement. The Secretary of State for Work and Pensions asked our Minister to agree that the Northern Ireland provisions remain in the Bill and to agree to bring forward the necessary <coughs> legislative consent motion. The Northern Ireland provisions mirror those made for Britain elsewhere in the Bill. Importantly, under the Bill, the power to make subordinate legislation and to commence provisions relating to devolved matters will vest in the Department for Communities. Likewise, the powers of control over the subordinate legislation will vest in the Assembly. The proposed changes are largely beneficial for scheme members. Pension dashboards will provide clarity regarding pension savings, while the introduction of important safeguards and deterrents against those who might seek to avoid their responsibilities relating to pension schemes will provide greater security for members. Recent pension reforms have meant that more people are making provision for their retirement through saving into a workplace pension, whilst individuals also have more flexibility over their pension at retirement. In just six years, across the UK, 10 million people are newly saving or saving more into a pension as a result of automatic enrolment. Although many private sector defined benefit contribution schemes are closed to new members and or new accruals, the sector remains an integral part of the pension system, with about 10.4 million members in Britain and Northern Ireland relying on them. In addition, with roughly 14,000 employers currently supporting defined benefit pension schemes and around 1.5 trillion in assets held by these schemes, the defined benefit sector is of crucial importance to the economy. This bill ensures that the pension system is fit for the future by strengthening the system and introducing important safeguards and deterrents against those who might seek to avoid their responsibilities. If the Northern Ireland provisions are omitted from the Westminster Bill, it would be necessary to bring forward a further Assembly Bill to ensure that the pension system continues to function and that scheme members here are not put at a disadvantage compared to people in G GB. Whilst it's difficult to be definitive, given the size and complexity, it's unlikely that the Westminster Bill will complete its passage most, much before the September recess. Yes, sorry, summer recess. I should have put my glasses on or polished them, sorry. <laughs> as the Westminster Bill will be subject to amendment as it makes its way through Parliament, now to date we've got 101 amendments have been tabled. We would not normally seek to introduce a bill in this area until the Westminster Bill is in its final form. This means that it's unlikely that a further Assembly Bill could be introduced before September 2020 at the earliest. Okay. At best, such an Assembly Bill would be unlikely to complete passage before spring 2021, and that's even assuming a slot could be obtained in the Legislative Programme. Based on our experience of previous bills in this area, our working assumption is that such a bill would fully mirror the provisions of the current Westminster Bill. Including Northern Ireland provisions in the Westminster Bill allows these important provisions to be enacted in Britain and here at the same time. This provides legal certainty for schemes and employers to allow preparatory work for example, in the introduction of collective money purchase benefits and pension dashboards to proceed in tandem in Britain and NI. As members are aware, 
The legislative consent motion process <coughs> and the committee's role in the process are set out in standing orders. The legislative consent process has been used in this area on a number of previous occasions, most recently for, for provisions in the Pension Schemes Act 2015. The intention is that a further legislative consent motion may be sought, sorry, will, yes, may be sought in relation to further amendments to the bill, depending on what comes out of the amendments, and will brief the committee on any such <coughs> amendments. I can also now confirm that the executive has agreed to proceed on the basis of this legislative consent motion. <coughs> and now we're happy to answer any questions. I just have a, just a few questions or points, Anne, and thank you for your briefing. Um, you stated um, in your paper that there have been a series of consultations. <coughs> that, um, do we know what level of responses there were from Northern Ireland, whether that was groups or individuals, um, and and you know where? Uh, I, I you know, can't were they in support of, or? Of, of the actual Tom may help, but I think they were, I, it was a very few. E each of the various papers which were issued were also put on the <coughs> site as well to encourage people here to actually um, answer or, or to give their views. But I, but I think the Northern Ireland input was very low. Yeah. And certainly over the, over the years, you know, this is the way it works out, we get very, very little feedback. Most of the schemes operating here actually <laughs> operate in, inside as, as such the public sector. Yeah. And we have a very strong, uh, as, a, as it were, footprint inside the public sector. But, uh, but of course, most of those schemes aren't aren't actually caught <coughs> these days because they are schemes which are, uh, you know, actually very well run and very well, you know, it's looked after schemes. You know, so therefore, we tend not to get very many comments on them. And you also mentioned about the 101 amendments um, being put forward. Um, does that indicate opposition, or does that indicate broadly no. welcome, or no, just no, it doesn't. Actually, the bill um, over at GB has, 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 has I would not say, has, has actually got a very fair win, okay, okay. and it's um, actually well liked by all all of the parties. Um, so the bill is currently inside the Lords, where you'd have a number of the peers who would be inside this area, actually very well versed and uh, you know you know had such very expert. And so there's a number of those amendments which are tabled is more as, as a way to look into the bill in, in greater depth, you know, and try to as such um, see you know as to what is under underneath the various provisions, you know, uh, and it's more to tease out things sometimes rather than actually hoping to change it. But, but uh, you know, and we just <coughs> such, um, and say, say that figure really, you know, said you know just how much is actually going on inside the bill, uh, and also why we think that we couldn't really take it forward now inside Northern Ireland. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's still we, a lot If there's anything decided. significant, we, we will be coming back yeah. to you on it. You know, you know, should there be any policy changes yeah. which haven't emerged then, we, 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 we then would come back to the committee again and we would brief you on them to make sure that you know fully what it is that you sign up to. Okay, thank you. I have Carl and then I have Mark Carl. So, thank you for coming back to the committee on this. Um, I mean, none of us want to hold any pension entitlements back, particularly for you know communication workers or any or anyone else for that matter. And I think we're all well aware of the issues where big companies, yeah. some of which their CEOs were knighted, uh, put workers in mm -hmm. really really dire hardship yeah. over their flagrant abuse or the lack of responsibility to those workers, so that goes without saying. Yeah. The concern that I had was that we were asked to agree an LCM prior to seeing the finished amended bill. Yeah, well, um, I, and so what we've done is that we have actually given you the bill as it stands. Yeah. And we're asking you to um, say that you are actually happy that is. As Anne said, should there be any, any further changes to the bill? And uh, so there's uh, uh, such uh, some new policy comes in, then uh, actually our plan would be to such come back to yourselves and say, look, this has changed uh, and this is what it does. And we would again be asking you to say that you were content with that change. But the issue for us is, first of all, we don't want to break with party because it's going to have an impact on the block grant. But we're asked to agree in a bill that in your introduction or your introductory remarks on it said that there wasn't any possibility of coming back before the summer recess. Mm -hmm. So we're really been asked to fly on a big airplane of good faith here. Yeah. And um, we, why we understand we've got the bill now, 
He didn't have You're the worried bill. about it being He didn't have the bill until we asked for it. No, 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 like the bill came and we uh, I, I actually sent you oh. the papers. Yeah. Okay. The LCM. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, obviously it's before we come to the committee, we sorry. first have to get this through sorry. our sorry to correct. You're right, we've seen the bill, but the amendments are still going through as we speak. So yes. we're not going to see those. No, 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 that's why sorry. we say um, yeah. you know, it should be, some some of the various amendments will all uh, so it's be very technical, which aren't changing the overall policy. Okay. But uh, and I'd say there is some new policy coming in or some change of um, substance. Our plan is uh, at that stage we, we actually would uh, should come back to yourselves and say, look, th this has been added in and this is what this does. Are you are you still happy? It just seems better upside down. I, I, that is the way the process works mm -hmm. under um, um, standing orders, um, standing order I, and 42A. I know, you know, I know. And so it provides for the LCM energy, and then it also provides for a, a further stage, um, and should there be changes. You know, so the we're just LC following the process. Yeah. You know, the LCM is, has to be done by a certain point during the process of the Westminster Bill, which means it has to be done before the bill is finished. You know, the bill is not finalised. Really, yeah. uh, um, hasn't got full. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, so under the current rules. Um, because I and say that your your view is that you're not happy with this, and say that 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 ice goes on the floor of the house, and, and it's the house votes no. But then I what we do is that we go back to GB and say no, this hasn't been approved, and all those bits have to come out of the bill. So, so that so for the bill still has to be you know as such there in inside Parliament at that stage for them to take the provisions out. You know, you know, so that's why there are time limits. But, but again, that's part of standing orders. You were uh, well, well, you'll be glad to know that the procedures committee agreed yesterday to have a look at oh, right, right, yeah, LCM. the legislative yeah. consent okay. motions. Because I, I should also say that our minister didn't you know, actually take this decision lightly. You mm -hmm. know, she weighed up all of the various facts <laughs> and. And indeed, she we was very aware I, I, of the merits of, you know, actually the role of the assembly looking at bills, and mm -hmm. she's very aware of all that. And I say, uh, and she didn't take this decision lightly. But we're responsible for pensions, so pensions are devolved to the assembly. But the apparatus of which pensions come through is still a reserve matter. Um, so, sorry, sorry, I'm not sure. So, so why are we responsible for pensions here? Yeah. Oh, you mean the pensions ombudsman? The fact that all the um, yes. Right, well, well all, all of the various bodies, like the pensions ombudsman yes. uh, and so the pensions regulator, etc., all, all of those operate for the whole of the UK. Mm -hmm. There are uh, and various reasons for that. This area of law is actually all, all very technical, as I'm sure, but if you've scanned through the bill, you know, that you'll fully appreciate that, that and it's the very history technical. of it, I'm sure. Yeah, it's and a history. We understand the history of why the bill's here. It's uh, the process and the vehicle yeah, which yeah. has gone through. But, but uh, and just if we could say, you know, as to why we have the bodies operating for the whole, whole of the UK, is because this area of law is an area where you need people who are absolute uh, uh, and so experts. For us to have set up our own in, inside Northern Ireland, uh, A, with two issues, one was the cost, but B, that we didn't have people who can actually staff it. Mm -hmm. you know, therefore, that's why that we rely on people who are experts. But these people also have to be experts as well as in pension schemes, but also other areas of law as, as well, corporate transactions, etc. And for us to have set up, and <coughs> bearing in mind that our, as you say, I'm sure footprint here is large in, inside of the actual I, I, the public sector, then, then I expect they wouldn't be, have, have to be looked at. So we, so, so we would have been setting up something for a very small number of cases. You know, and so that's why they operate for the UK wide. That wasn't my question, but oh, sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry, I misunderstood you then. Sorry. Thanks, Jerry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. I'm sorry, I apologise. I thought you were asking why these no, no. Uh, bodies operate at UK, no. right? Sorry, okay, that's my fault. No. Okay, so I misunderstood you. Thank you. Did I answer just, your just question? No, um, but I'm okay. Oh, okay. I mean, I, on, I don't think we're going to get an answer All right, okay. outside of a review of the LCM process here. Right. Well, but again, just say that everything we've done is it's like striking corns with standing order 42, uh, you know. Okay, Mark, order. you wanted to come in? I think it might have already not been answered. Okay. <laughs> right, sorry. Right. 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 You give us a go again. We'll try. Right. 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 I firmly believe that the you know, involved issues sh should be dealt with uh, by us, but I think the last thing any of us around this uh, table or around the Assembly Chamber would want to do is, is penalise or in some way negatively impact upon pensioners, particularly, or anyone for that matter, uh, here in, in, in the North. But, I just kind of have this view that beware of Tories bearing gifts, and it does look like a gift. There are so many positives uh, in this piece of legislation, 
as it is now, yeah. but it is open to amendment or vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, to amendment, and, and, and that would be a, a concern I'm sure uh, many of us uh, would share here. Now, the, uh, just like to drill down a wee bit, Jerry, you mm -hmm. a lot of the 100 odd amendments are laid thus far are technical, but if anything new comes in, policy wise or anything, mm -hmm. that, that would come back here. You know, what would actually constitute? That though, do you know how much of a change to what well, we've seen? Now? Well, I, when, I, when I say various technical amendments, um, you know, I'm saying we're changing references, or there's just a bit to me where the law was put in wasn't absolutely clear, for example. And so, therefore, they say, well, hold on, and we will make that, you know, how, you know absolutely clear. <coughs> say, say during the course of the, of the actual House looking at it, somebody says, well, that's not very clear. Could you not make that clear? You know, so we understand what that actually means. And so they might be changed. Those, those would fall within the field of being all looked upon as being a, 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 such ab, absolutely technical. But say we introduce a, and some new policy that com, comes in, or say there's um, one, one of the policies inside the bill changes. So something which is inside the bill, and they say, OK, and so we won't do that policy anymore, or that we will put in something new. Then, then I suppose those would be the kinds of things which we would come back to you and, and ask you again, are you, are you still happy with this? No, it's, it's just that there would be the concern. I'm sure that this could be some sort of. I, I mean, tro al alternatively. No, well, al you know, it's alternative. But if the committee wants, we could come back and speak to you about every amendment which is actually accepted. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're sort of ha happy to do that. Sounds you know, like but if that would over mean, here, die cut you. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 but I, I'm just not sure what, 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 what you know that I, I can say to win. Then you know, yeah, I, I, you know, but if I, you know, I, I'd be volunteered to come back and but speak to you about every really amendment. Good. Okay, and so I shall do that. But well, I'm not Mark sure if I would benefit. Private meeting for that one. Uh, <laughs> another one. That's a couple of things. You, you know, I, I mean, I, I can certainly say that our intention always is to act in, in, a, in, in absolute that. best faith. I mean, I you know, I'm you know, sure you've never tried to do anything, you know, which the committee isn't aware. Of, you know, certainly not consciously, anyway. But you know, uh, so you know, so we certainly would be doing our best to make sure we act in you no, know no. absolute good faith. Uh, I would certainly acknowledge Great that. Or you don't trust Jerry, it's, <laughs> yes. it's not Jerry. Well, well, well that's, no, that's but the only good sure. thing is, as we're, as I think I made the point, this um, this bill is actually I uh, and well liked by all all of the parties, yeah. Labour, I uh, mm -hmm. and Lib Dems, Tories, uh, yeah. and, and as such cross benchers. Oh, I mean, every, every, well, everybody. Well, it, like, you know, there's a lot of good stuff, uh, and certainly for the likes of, and I, I think Carol mentioned, uh, and Sir Philip Green. Mm. You know, those kinds of people. Who, I didn't mention uh, his name. name. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I didn't say BHS, did you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, maybe I mentioned But, yes, but, yes. but you're right, yes. Sorry, the BHS scheme. Okay, well, I mentioned the names, all right. The BHS scheme, you know, where we do, you know, where we think the system had failed. And these are the kinds of things we're trying to. Oh, no, 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 no. That's certainly uh, welcome. I think then, like Carl, she's said about the work that needs to be done on procedures, but it's, it's maybe around the chronology or yeah, yeah, choreography yeah. of it. Yeah. Like why it has to come at this stage rather than later on before Royal Assent when, when it has completed its passage. Well, well uh, you know, our, our problem is, you know, all, all of these bits would have to fall out of the Westminster Bill, you know, it's, you know, it's before it gets RA, right. you, know, you know, you know, that's where you're caught, you know, with the LCM. But, but then the LCM itself goes back, you know, actually uh, as, such a, as a part of, you know, the uh, it's a very good start, you know, from the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. You know, you actually had provision in this to allow that certain things could be done from Westminster, oh, no, no, right, sense. you know, so, you know, this isn't new, it's not novel or anything like that, you know, uh, and so it's been there from day one. And I say, uh, and there have been various bills which we have used it for yeah. here and in the past. <coughs> but again, all, 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 all I can do is stress that we would act in, you know, in sort of absolute good faith with you here to try and ensure that you, uh, and indeed bore you to death with some of the members. <laughs> if you really want to hear them all. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, if there's no other members, um, just thank you for coming in and thank explaining you. that to us. Thank we, you. And I suppose, as Carl says, until Procedures Committee take a, a proper look at this, we are where we are. Yeah. When it comes to LCMs and some of the things we, we do have yeah. to accept, um, but certainly um, allowing us to question on various issues um, is is good for this committee and it's good for us in general to get that information. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay. All right. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> okay, members. We're flying along now and we're going to move straight into uh, agenda item eight, which is a statutory rule, which is another one of the tongue twisters. So I will start then by. Uh, uh, asking members to turn to page 
876 of their files, and we're going to look like at statute rule 2020 26, the pneumoconiosis, um, etc., workers' compensation amendment regulations, Northern Ireland. Can I ask members if they have any objection to this rule? No. Okay. Following that, I put the question that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-26, the pneumoconiosis, etc., workers' compensation amendment regulations, Northern Ireland, and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Great. Read. Thank Read. you. Okay, then we will move on to agenda item number nine, which is any other business. Can I ask if there's any other business, Kelly? Um, yes, Chair. I was going to ask if it's possible um, for a, a meeting very soon to get an update from the department just on what's happening with the welfare mitigations. I'm very aware that um, so far the minister, um, I think it's the executive, haven't got that legislation for welfare mitigations forward. Um, I'm a run out of time, um, and it would be really useful. I, I believe that there's no argument about this <coughs> going forward. The minister's doing her thing, but there's going to be a gap between the end of this financial year and and when the legislation comes forward. And I just, while everybody keeps on telling me it's okay, I just don't see legally how civil servants can pay the bedroom tax or the, any of those other mitigations during the gap. And it really would be appreciated if we can get clarification on that. Okay, yes, agreed. members, yep, yeah, agreed. Okay, we'll get that um, sooner rather than later. Um, I know we're away next week on an away day, but if we need clarification on that, we may have to hold, um, you know, an, a, an extra meeting at the end of that or whatever yeah. to discuss that. Is that okay? That would be good. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay, any other business members? No? Okay, we'll move on then. Agenda item 10, date and time of next meeting. And as I said, uh, members, next week we have got our committee strategic, plan strategic planning day. That will start at 10 a.m. next Thursday, the 19th, at the Skinos Centre in the Newton Road. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.